Greetings all and welcome back to another session here of Tuesday Talks. Today we're going to be jumping into a little bit of English grammar. We're going to finish up our phrase structure rules and we'll be looking at uh, more of the verb in this uh, session and some more of the uh, other types of uh, small changes that need to be done called um, uh, sentence derivations. Now let's jump right in here and look at the English verb uh, system. And so, let's take a quick peek, first of all, at this whole idea of tense. As I mentioned in the earlier study, we actually only have two tenses in English, although there are, again, you were taught in grammar school that um, we had six or nine or even 12 different uh, tenses. In point of fact, we only have two and we have a number of aspects. And you can mix and match those to get everything that we need and use um, in uh, American English. Uh, tenses that we have are basically present and past. And some examples that we have here, Tomoko and Tom eat rice for breakfast. Eat, present tense. Greta eats cheese and milk. Okay, that's present tense. And then the past would be uh, Tomoko rode her bike. Greta walked to the pier. You see how the verb is actually being changed directly. Okay, and that's how you can tell that it's a tense when you're having some type of direct change either internally or with an added uh, morpheme that you see a tense. Um, we get all the other verbs that we uh, need, all the other times and understandings of things through what we call aspects. Uh, and we have two major aspects. One is the progressive, which is B plus ING. And we have the perfect tense, which is have plus EN or ED. Please note how these are connected. If you have a B in the verb and it's progressive, you're going to have an ING. If you have a have in the main verb, you're going to have an EN or an ED. They are related. And uh, when I teach people about language, I absolutely want to show them this so that they can understand it's not always the same in their language. In many languages it is. A lot of the Romance languages, again, like Spanish, Italian, French, they, they will have this type of structure. But in other languages, it doesn't exist, and so they need to figure out another way of doing it. So you want to make sure you can explain that, and hopefully you can understand here what I'm saying. So we've got two tenses, present and past. We have two aspects, progressive and perfect. And again, we can mix and match uh, these to get some of the things that we're talking about. Let's take a look at some of the options that are available for auxiliary verbs. In the uh, present tense here, we look, uh, we see we got no auxiliary options that are there. We just have the word talks, which is adding, uh, adding to the verb and listens the same way. Modals, we're going to add an auxiliary. That's a possibility is that you can add a modal like can or may or might or must uh, or should. Jill can drive to the park. That's an auxiliary option. I can have a modal. I can have things like the present perfect, uh, has gone, Jahan has gone home. Okay, so I'm going to have, again, has plus uh, en or ed. Um, so that's the present perfect. You know, the present progressive, where we have Sheldon is sleeping. And again, we're going to put these two together, the ing here, uh, to make the progressive. But uh, this is going to be part of the auxiliary, right? Same thing here. If we have the uh, this present with a phrasal motive, um, like is going to. So Penny is going to need money. Is going to is all going to be that auxiliary. Okay, be going to is an auxiliary means needs, right? Uh, in this case, I could use needs uh, or must, must have, right? Uh, is going to be here. I can have an imperative. This is something that's actually not written in the uh, surface structure of the sentence, but in the underlying structure, it exists. If I give you a command such as open the door, the U is not spoken, but it is in the underlying structure, but it's not in the surface structure. As well as in the auxiliary, you have the imperative that you put there um, to let you know what the mood of the sentence is. Um, so those are a number of the auxiliary options that are available. You also need to recognize that there are a lot of irregular verbs that uh, may change uh, some of these auxiliary options, but by and large, these are the main ones that you're going to have as you try to build sentences and also as you try to teach. So today we're going to be working at through numbers eight. Uh, through uh, the end, we're going to be looking at some of the adverbials, and we're going to be mainly looking, though, at uh, the verb structures here. Uh, let's take a look at number 11, which is, again, where your verbs begin here. Uh, and what do we have in here? But we have tense and mode and uh, imperative. These all go together. And then, and then, of course, your modals can be phrasal modals. You can also have 
uh, the modal, uh, the modal of um, the have verb or the be verb or a combination of the two. So you've got auxiliary, you've got tense and modal, you've got uh, present and past tense as far as your tenses are concerned. You have phrasal modals, you have a perfect aspect, and you have a progressive aspect. Again, all these can, can be combined in different ways. Let's take a look at an example, okay? So we've got a, a sentence here. Uh, John has been writing a book. And so we have a subject, John, which is the, the noun phrase, and the noun phrase is all by itself. And then we have uh, the, the rest of the sentence, has been writing a book. We have a verb phrase here. And the verb phrase is broken down into the auxiliary and the main verbs. There's probably an M here just so that we know that it's the main verb. We have the auxiliary, and in the auxiliary we have a tense, which we could put in here as uh, uh, present. Um, and then we have a part of perfect here. We have the perfect element here. Now take a look at this. The perfect element is part is combined as well as the progressive. The perfect element is the stuff that's in red here. The has and the en, ed. The progressive element is the B and the ING. So that's what connects these here. And so you see how it breaks apart in order uh, to create the structure that we want. So when we're looking at uh, trying to explain this to somebody, if you're going to have a B in the auxiliary, you need an ING. If you're going to have a have in the auxiliary, you're going to need an EN or an ED so that you can get these perfects and these progressives. Because things are broken down and separated and hooked at, at, uh, to different places. Um, and so that's what, that's what these are. Okay? Of course, then you have the main verb, which is right. Okay? And the ING has been added because we want the progressive. And then we have, within uh, the, the uh, predicate, we have another noun phrase, which is a book, very simple noun phrase. And again, I remind you that uh, in some, some uh, people who write uh, tree diagramming, they'll take this and actually put it in here, because it's describing what he's writing, and I won't do that. I'll put it outside, um, because again, for me, I'd rather have a separate branch only for the verb. Uh, it's just to me a little easier to understand what's going on there. All right, some more uh, on phrase structure uh, rules here. We're looking at number 15, which is your verb phrase. And your verb phrase can have your main verb, and it can have, it can be a copula, which is the B verb, uh, or it can be broken down into other parts here. Let's take a look at this again. Now remember, the, uh, this stuff here with a copula, I can have a variety of things after it. It can be a noun, it can be an adjective, it can be a preposition. Uh, we're not going to look at it, this one here. Now we're going to look at a main verb here. Let's look at another example. We've got a sentence that's broken down. My mother might take us to the store. We've got a main sentence here, obviously. This first top layer here is a piece of cake to do because it's in everything. Okay? Um, and it's, it's in everything. Let's just move on from that. Under the subject, we've got some type of noun phrase. The noun phrase can have a whole bunch of things in it, and this one particularly only has two. Uh, which is a determiner and uh, the noun. You've got your main verb that's coming off here and your main, oops, your verb phrase coming off here and your main verb is take. Your auxiliary is just that one word, um, might, which is a modal. You can add that in the middle here if you want. I'll put in a modal uh, as a phrase. That doesn't really matter to me. Um, within your predicate also, you have a noun phrase, takes us, okay, this is who he's taking, and then to the store, which is an adverbial, that's your structure, I'm sorry, that's your uh, uh, function, okay, and then it's also a prepositional phrase. These both are the same thing, but we describe it both in form and function. Okay, so you've got this uh, prepositional phrase, to the store. It's got a preposition. It's got a noun phrase, which is broken down to determiner and a noun. Prepositional phrase is its form. That's what it looks like. Its function is an ad adverbial phrase, which is describing uh, where we're being taken. Okay, so that's the breakdown for that. Object noun predicates. So we've got a variety of places where we can put uh, noun predicates. Obviously, we can have them at the beginning. Uh, as a noun phrase, here is another noun phrase, okay? This is a direct object, and this is um, a descriptor of it. Some might call this an adjective, but you could also call it another noun phrase um, that's... I, I take that back. You could call this a noun phrase that's acting like an adjective, telling you what he is. You can also break it down the way it is here to say 
they elected Sam, who will be the treasurer. A reduced clause to a reduced uh, prep, uh, infinitive to just one word. Um, but again, it's a noun phrase because it's defining, it's defining uh, who was elected. You can look at it another place here. We've got a noun phrase, Donna, place the book on the table. We've got here as a regular subject. Here we have it as um, a direct object, and here we have it as the object of a preposition. Variety of places where you can put these noun phrases. Another example, Ned held the book under his arm. Okay, um, So here we have noun phrase, another direct object, and under his arm is a preposition, but it's, just, it's actually describing... Uh, where he held it, okay? Um, so um, this one's going to be called an adverbial phrase. You can probably do the same thing with this one here. Remember form and function. All right, some other roles here. You've got direct object, which I've already spoken of. Indirect object, okay? I gave Mary the ball. What are you giving? You're actually giving the ball. You're giving the ball, and you're giving it to Mary, indirect object. It be the object of a preposition, uh, as in in her bag. It can be a predicate, um, predicate nominative, they would call it, when you probably knew you were growing up. Mary is a referee. Referee and Mary are the same thing. In this case, you know, this copula just basically means equals. Um, you could look at it that way. You could also make it a noun, uh, a noun predicate, again, which is similar to what was going on up here, right? Um, the elected, I'm sorry, they elected Mary the chief referee. Uh, missing a letter, a letter here. They elected Mary the chief uh, referee. Okay, and again, same type of structure as before. Okay, let's look at uh, the syntactic role of the prepositional phrase. What can the prepositional phrase be used for? Or where can it be used? We can put it in a noun phrase, for example, the walk of fame. Of fame is your prepositional phrase. Okay, it's working functioning here as an adjective, right? A pound of cure. Okay, it can be in a verb phrase, drove to the bank. Okay, and uh, again, in uh, some, uh, some texts will, some researchers, some linguists will say this belongs in the main verb phrase. I'll take it outside and just leave it in the predicate. Um, but you can see where it can be there describing the verb, adverbial phrase here. Sank under the table, same type of thing. We're describing, describing the verb. It can be just an adjective phrase, fond of cats, um, happy for you, okay? Um, it can be a noun predicate, okay? Needs money in her account. Here, in her account, is describing what, where the money is supposed to be, right? Um, so, the variety of different places where you can put uh, prepositions. Sometimes prepositions describe verbs, sometimes they describe nouns. Last thing on our list here are sentence derivations. You'll note as we're looking at uh, examples of um, uh, sentences, like, like this one here, uh, there are times where we may need to take information and tweak it a little bit. Um, so, for example, here we have an auxiliary, and the auxiliary is using the present perfect. I'm sorry, we're using the perfect tense, which requires us to use have. But have needs to be modified so that it can be has, right? And the way that you do that is with, with something that they call sentence derivations. And that's where you take information from the subject and modify what's being done here in your uh, in your auxiliary or in your main verb so that the uh, person and number can be accounted for. Um, and that's what's being done there. So when we go back and look at the rules here for sentence derivations, you copy the person number from the subject to the tense. Okay, And they're basically calling that copying uh, the subject information to the tense so that everything applies normally. You're also going to apply morphological morphemes. Um, so, for example, if you have a plural, you need to apply it. If you have a, a, a word that was originally an adjective and you're making it an adverb, or it was originally a noun and you're making it um, a, a, an adjective, well, you need to add those morphemes. Okay, and so after the sentence derivations, now you can see what the surface structure actually looks like. I don't want to deal with sentence uh, derivations very often. Normally, when people look at these, they just look at this sentence here and they say, oh, okay, it's has because of the present perfect, and they automatically in their head, 
they just they just change this from the from person and your students may need to understand that you need to copy that over so sentence derivations may be an important thing for you as well as the morphological rules uh, when we are going to be breaking things down, if ever, if you guys are going to be around with me as we uh, do uh, some tree diagramming, I'm not going to worry about you creating these, writing these rules afterwards. I'll assume that you're doing it properly by the way you create the structure of the sentence. Okay, and that's all I have for today. I want to thank you for taking a peek at all these things. And if you do have any questions or comments, you can shoot them down below. And I hope that you have a good day. Bye-bye now.